didn't see you there. Welcome. My name is Eric Choate, and I'm organist and choir master at Church of St. Mary the Virgin, San Francisco. Today, I'd like to tell you about our organ. The organ is the king of instruments, so named because of its sonic power, its magnitude, its majesty. No other instrument has such color possibilities, such dynamic range, or such capacity to sustain a room full of people singing. It creates sounds from the softest whispers for the most holy moments during the Mass, to the grand earth-shaking thunder which reminds us of God's infinite presence and command. The organ is the instrument of the church, and it is one of her greatest evangelists. It draws people unto her, provides hope for the poor, joy for the sorrowful, succor for those in pain. It prays on our behalf. It creates the most dignified sounds suitable to welcome God among us. It shouts songs of praise when our language is insufficient to convey our fervor. The organ is not an accessory of our worship. It is inextricably connected to our worship. Today, I will give you a tour of our organ here at St. Mary's. When Dale Wood took the post as organist and choir master in 1968, there was a 10 rank George Andrews organ entirely contained in the gallery where the choir of four singers was also situated. That organ was installed in 1893 and had fallen into such disrepair that it was no longer worth maintaining. So for $40,000, they bought the instrument that we have today. This instrument was installed in 1970 by M.P. Moeller in Hagerstown, Maryland. It's a modest instrument, not without its quirks, but it's been a part of St. Mary's since 1970. Dale Wood had a prominent role in designing the organ's specifications or stop list. Generally, organs are built specifically for the space for which they are destined. It's important to consider that the instrument is not just the mechanical bits of the organ. The instrument is also the room. Every church is different. They all have different acoustics, so one organ will behave completely differently in one church from the next. Organ builders take so many factors into consideration when designing an instrument for the space. The amount of space they have to contain the pipes, the size and shape of the room, the acoustics of the space, the needs of the congregation, the style of worship, and so on. Hundreds of factors inform how an organ is designed and built. Let's take a tour of our 1970 Moeller. It has two keyboards, called manuals, and one pedal board. The pipes are located behind the screen in the front of the church. In the basement beneath the sanctuary, there's a blower which fills up bellows with air, and bellows send air to large chests situated directly under the pipes. And when a key is depressed, a valve opens at the foot of the pipe, allowing pressurized air to flow from the chests through the pipes, thus creating sound. Some organs are tracker organs, meaning that the manuals and pedals connect to a wooden tracker, which connects mechanically to the valves. Other organs, like this one, are electro-pneumatic, meaning that when a key is depressed, it sends an electronic signal to open the valves. There are two basic kind of pipes. Flue pipes, think recorder, and reeds, think clarinet. Flue pipes include principles, which are pipes that make the typical organ sound. They don't imitate any other instrument. Then there are flutes, which imitate the sound of a flute, and there are strings which imitate the sound of stringed instruments. All of these flue pipes are basically like different length recorders. When the air passes through the foot of the pipe, it's directed outward through the upper lip of the mouth of the pipe, thus causing the pipe to vibrate at different pitch levels depending on its length. Some are made of wood and some are made of metal. 
The other type of pipe is a reed, and it creates a sound when air passes a metal tongue that vibrates against a brass tube called a shallot. The rest of the pipe, called the resonator, magnifies the sound and informs the pitch. Unlike the piano, these keys are not weighted. On a piano, if I depress a key with a more weight, it produces a louder sound. Likewise, if I play a key with a lighter touch, it produces a softer tone. On the organ, the weight of your touch has no effect on the volume of sound produced. Each manual and pedal has a division of its own and has different ranks of pipes, each making different tones. Let's start with the grate. The grate is the division that is played on this lower manual. It consists of sounds that one most principally associates with the organ. Each stop has a number on it. In this case, we have the numbers 16, 8, 4, and 2. This number tells you the length of pipe for the lowest note. An 8-foot stop means that the lowest pipe is 8 feet long and that the sound that comes out will be exactly at pitch. So this A will be the exact same octave as that same A on the piano. A four-foot stop means that the lowest pipe is four feet long and that the sound that comes out will be one octave higher. A two-foot pipe will produce a note yet another octave higher than that. And 16-foot, twice the length of the eight-foot pipes, will produce a sound that is an octave lower. The principal chorus is the backbone of the organ, and we have an eight-foot principal a four-foot principle, and a two-foot principle. But when I engage all of them together in a chorus, it makes a typical organ sound. This is one of my go-to registration for hymns. We also have a flute chorus, which is noticeably softer than the principal chorus. On this organ, we have a 16-foot flute, which is actually borrowed from the swell, we'll get there, and an 8-foot flute. This stop here has a Roman numeral instead of an Arabic number. This is called a mixture, and the Roman numeral tells us how many ranks of pipes sound for each note depressed. For notes up until middle C, it plays three ranks of pipes. And for notes upward of middle C sharp, it plays four ranks of pipes. It plays combinations of octaves and fifths above the note that you play. You would never use it by itself, but in combination with other pipes, it lends a very bright characteristic to the registration. Here's that same passage, this time with mixtures. There's one other knob on the grate, this one here, grate four. It isn't a rank of pipes, but it gives us the option to play everything not only at pitch, but also with the octave above simultaneously. These other stops here are borrowed from the swell. So let's look at the swell next. The swell is a division that's played on this upper manual. It's under expression, meaning that the pipes are in a separate case and shutters, controlled by a pedal down here, open and close, offering the option for dynamic control over the pipes in this division. This is one of my favorite aspects of the organ. On a good instrument, when you have the full swell with the box closed and gradually open it, it is positively thunderous. It's truly one of the most thrilling effects the organ produces. Our organ kind of does it, and I'm not sure how effective it will be on camera, but here we go.
The swell has a flute chorus at the 8 foot, 4 foot, and 2 foot levels. And we have another mixture on the swell. And this manual is where both of our reeds live. We have an 8 foot trumpet. and a four-foot trictor regal. More often than not, I actually play the trictor regal down an octave, and it sounds rather like a clarinet. And we also have a rank of strings called a gamba. You have to use your imagination here. They're not anything like an orchestral string section, but they have a quality that reminds us of strings. And finally, we have a voix celeste. A celeste is a rank of pipes that are tuned slightly sharper than the rest. And in combination with the gamba, they produce a wonderful tone. Here's the gamba alone. And here's the celeste alone. very, very slightly sharper. And here they are together. Now, it's designed to mimic a section of strings from the orchestra. A string section does not actually play exactly in tune with one another. I don't say that to have a go at them. It would actually sound very unnatural if a string section of 42 players actually played exactly in tune. The slight variation in pitch is what makes strings so lush and warm. So, organ builders have figured out how to mimic that effect on organs. Logically, the next division would involve a third manual below the grate called the choir, named because of its purpose for accompanying the choir. As a matter of fact, the original specifications that Dale Wood designed included a third manual complete with another rank of principles, another rank of flutes, a crumb horn, which is a reed, and a nazard, which plays a twelfth above the written pitch. And in combination with another stop, it would sound like this. For one reason or another, that third manual never happened. In our case, rather than a choir, we have a third division called the gallery because it's located in the gallery of the church. But we only have two manuals. This is a floating division, meaning that it can be played on the grate, on the swell, or on the pedal. Our gallery is also under expression, and its shutters are controlled by a pedal down here. We have a flute chorus at eight and four foot. We have a principal chorus at four foot and two foot. And we have not one, but two different celestes. This one is another string celeste, like the one on the swell. And this one is a flute celeste. These celestes play two different ranks of pipes at once, with one tuned ever so slightly sharper than the other. It's almost embarrassing that on an organ of this side, we have three celestes. One would be perfectly enough, but I won't complain. This flute celeste here is maybe my favorite individual stop on this particular instrument. I often use it at the beginning of my improvisation during communion. With the tremolo on and the box closed, it seems as though it comes down to us from heaven. The pedal division is played with my feet on these pedals down here. It contains the largest and lowest pipes of the organ. I actually have to wear special shoes to play the organ. They're basically dance shoes with large heels 
to facilitate ease of movement from one pedal to the next. We have a flute chorus at the 16, 8, and 4 foot level. There's actually a stop here, but the knob came off a while ago. Anyway, that one's the 16 foot flute. And we have a principal chorus at the 16, 8, and 4 foot level. And we have a 16 foot reed. as well as a four-foot reed. And when I play all of them in combination, it sounds pretty impressive. Now suppose I want to play with a combination of pipes from the great and the swell together. I can engage these couplers, which groups the swell down with the great manual. I can couple it down at the 16 foot level and at the 4 foot level too. I can also couple both the swell and the great down to the pedal keyboard. When I want a unified sound across my hands and feet, I usually couple the manuals to the pedal. But sometimes the pedal does something completely independent from the manuals, or sometimes the composer wants to distinguish the music played on the manuals from the pedal. In those cases, I would not couple the manuals to the pedal. I can even get super creative. Let's say I have a piece of music that calls for a certain registration on the grate. Let's say this eight foot flute and a four foot reed in the pedal, but I actually want to use this four foot reed from the swell on the pedal. So there it is on the swell, and then I send the swell to pedal. And the piece of music also indicates that I should have another hand playing on the choir. Well, since we don't have a third manual, but we do have this gallery, I can actually turn the swell unison off so the swell pipes don't actually sound when I play them on the manual, but they still sound when I play them on the pedal, since I have them coupled down. And I can assign the gallery to the swell. And how about this nice flute celeste? So now I get to pretend that this is a three manual instrument. Oftentimes, music necessitates instantaneously changing multiple stops. To facilitate this, we have pistons, or memory settings, like the radio presets in the car. Now, it would be impractical to change each stop individually every time I wanted to change the registration. Although many instruments, especially organs from the Baroque and Baroque-style instruments, don't have any pistons. But on this instrument, I can preset all of these pistons to instantaneously change the registrations. On this organ, there are five generals. which controls settings to be applied to the entire instrument. It also has four divisionals on the swell, four divisionals on the grate, and down here, four divisionals for the pedal. And these divisionals control settings only for the individual divisions. 
Many organs have dozens of generals and divisionals, allowing for endless programming of stop combinations, with a hundred or so memory levels on top of that. Our modest little instrument has one memory level and a limited number of pistons. I have a standard piston for hymns with a more or less generic stock registration. I use a couple that I set to accompany whatever choir music we happen to sing on that particular day, and one or two for my voluntaries. Because there are such few options, oftentimes I need to reset some of the pistons during mass to get ready for the next piece of music. And it makes a horrible sound too. So if you ever hear that noise coming from me during the homily, you'll know what I'm up to. Many organs have a Zimbostern, an accessory that chimes little brass bells for a festive flair. When I took this post at St. Mary's, I noticed a toe stud down there called Polish Stern. What's that, I thought. In all of my years as an organist, I've never encountered an organ with a Polish Stern. At that time, it wasn't working, so when I pushed it, nothing happened. I researched the internet thoroughly and asked several colleagues, and nobody had ever heard of a Polish Stern. Michael Secor finally explained to me where this enigma came from. Upon completion of the installation, the organ builders from Moeller had a celebratory dinner in Chinatown. They came across a shop selling wind chimes, so they bought one and built a Zimbelstern out of an erector set. It doesn't come close to measuring up to a proper Zimbelstern, and the organ builders had too much pride to call it a Zimbelstern. As a matter of fact, it's so far from sounding like a Zimbelstern that during a choir rehearsal one time, Michael Secor had inadvertently turned it on and a choir member raised his hand and asked, what's that noise that sounds like broken glass? So, the organ builders installed this feature without telling Dale Wood. When he sat down at the bench for the very first time, he pointed to that toe stud and he said, what's that? Try it and find out, they said. They mutually agreed on calling it a Polish Stern because both Dale Wood and the organ builder had a common Polish heritage. I use it about once a year during Christmas Eve Midnight Mass for a little festive touch, or if I'm being honest with myself, I just find it amusing. Now that you've seen everything that the console does, I'll take you to the organ chambers. Come on back with me. Here we are at the balcony of the church, and I'll show you the gallery organ. Behind this metal door is the blower. And way back in the back there, you can't really see it very well, it's dark, but there's the blower back there. And then air travels from the blower into this bellows. It's turned off right now, but when it's on, that's inflated with air. And then the air passes from the bellows through this pipe into the gallery organ, which we'll see next. Up here is the gallery division. I'm not actually going to go in there because I did yesterday and it took me about a half an hour to figure out how to get back down. But there are the pipes. Before we go see the rest of the organ, this is a nice view up here. Stained glass back there, that's pretty good. So now that we've seen the gallery, come on back with me and I'll show you the rest of the organ. So here we are in a room that I'll bet you've never seen before. We're in the basement of the church, directly underneath the sanctuary. Over there is the old crypt, which we used before we had the columbarium, which we have now. 
and way at the back end of the nave, there's a trap door to access the crypt, which the acolytes and choristers actually step over so as to not wake those who are sleeping. And in here is the blower for the main part of the organ. So here is the main blower for the organ. So the blower, as I mentioned, is a large fan, and it sends air through these pipes, which go up into the bellows on the main floor. It's important that the blower is in a completely separate room, because as you can hear, it makes a lot of noise and would otherwise compete with the music coming from the organ. I don't know about you, but I'm about ready to get out of here, so let's go back upstairs. Here we are in the sacristy, and through this door is the rest of the main part of the organ. There are two doors here. And this lower one is where the bellows are. So now the organ's on, so you can see that they're inflated with air. And that keeps a pressurized flow of air going from the bellows up through these pipes into the chests, which are above. And this next door up are the pipes in the small division. And around the corner here, these are the shutters which open and close controlled by a pedal that I have at the organ console and that controls the dynamic level of the swell division so when they're closed it sounds softer out in the nave and when they're open it sounds louder and more brilliant. Next we're going to climb up this janky ladder all the way up there to where the Great Division is. Here we are in the Great Division, and this is the closest that we'll get to the pipes today. If you look carefully, you'll see that you can actually adjust the length of the pipe. So when the organ tuners come, they'll adjust the length, they'll either lengthen it slightly or shorten it slightly, and that on a micro level adjusts the pitch so that the organ tuner can make sure that all of the pipes are sounding in tune with one another. Here's a view that I'll bet you've never seen before. There's the church, we're behind the altar screen, and we are just above the altar painting. And we're going to come around here for our grand finale. Here is our famed Polish stern. So, the organ builders attached a tube to this chest full of pressurized air over here. And air travels through the tube and it pushes this fan, which rotates the entire apparatus, making the wind chimes jingle. Ellen is down at the organ console right now, and I'm going to have her turn it on. Ellen, hit it. Needs a little help. There it goes. Thank you so much for joining me on this tour of our 1970 Moeller organ. That's all for now. Stay tuned for our next Music Note release. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and God bless.